All right. So, um, yeah, the original title only talked about blood flow. It's it's actually a little bit more involved at the moment. Um, so I started to get mainly interested in uh, lymphocyte trafficking. Um, and, and this all sort of happens in the context of radiation um, treatment um, because it's yeah, you know, that is just the department that I'm at. I'm at the radiation oncology department. Um, so, so it's a little bit sort of as a disclaimer before I start. It's a little bit less, I guess, uh, sort of the the hall hallmarks of cancer um, type of thing, but more sort of a systemic. What happens um, to to the immune system when we ir irradiate patients, and of course that is interesting also for people looking into sort of um, hallmarks of cancer as, as we have heard before and we'll hear i think um in in later talks that the immune system is actually very important um but my talk will not necessarily be about sort of the the micro environment of the tumor um itself but more systemically all right that being said let's dive in so just to give you a little bit of background um, about, so, so, so I'm looking into radiation induced uh, lymphopenia. So, so that's a drop in lymphocyte counts in the blood that is measured, taking blood samples of patients sort of before and, and after or during treatment. And you see that there's a, there's a steady decline during over the course of the treatment. So radiation treatment is given into fractions. So the patient comes in for, let's say, five five weeks every day and gets a fraction of treatment. And during that course of treatment, um, it is observed clinically that um, lymphocytes gets depleted in the blood. Um, and this kind of happens for a wide variety of treatment sites. Um, and the fact sort of why this is interesting is because um it is correlated with worse outcomes so that of course doesn't necessarily mean that it's a causal relationship but it, it at least makes it worthwhile to study um how this effect comes about so this is one example here of i could have picked many because there's many such reports um this is in small, small cell lung cancer patients um, that were treated I'm either with chemoradiotherapy or with chemoradiotherapy plus uh, immune, uh, immune treatments. And um, shown here is that patients that experience severe radiation-induced lymphopenia, so real, <laughs> R-I-L, um, fare much worse than patients who don't. Um, and, and this is also observed across the board for different treatment sites. Um, and the sort of the current running hypothesis is that the direct cytotoxic effect of radiation kills um, circulating lymphocytes. So lymphocytes circulating in blood. Um, so so this is this was sort of the outlook of the project, right? Uh, simulate the treatment plan, calculate lymphocyte dose, so the dose that lymphocytes receive, and based off of that, predict sort of lymphocyte survival. Um, and then use that to optimize the treatment. So for example, look at different, you know, there are certain parameters that we as radiation oncologists can play with, or I'm not a radiation oncologist, but the radiation oncologists can play with, um, such as uh, the dose rate, uh, fractionation scheme, treatment modality, so protons versus phosons. Um, and, and also just rethinking those constraints, right? So that it's an optimization um, kind of setting. So you want to irradiate the target, which is the tumor, but you want to spare um, organs at risk, so just normal tissue, basically. So you could think of lymphocytes just being another organ at risk, and you can readapt those constraints um, that reflect that. Um, so this was our first attempt. Um, it, it only looked at sort of dose to the blood, uh, since lymphocytes are circulating in the blood. Um, so we built this uh, stochastic model of lymphocyte circulation in the blood. So it's this compartmental model. Um, and 
you know, to, to gain more granularity in, in terms of uh, spatial location of of, um, of blood vessels. We, we created also these phantoms that were then registered to patient-specific anatomies. Um, so as you can see, patients are, are blood particles are traveling through this, this system, this systemic system, and pick up those as they uh, traverse sort of the high-dose region. Um, and from that, we calculate what we call a dose volume histogram of the blood. So it, it sort of, stratif uh, sort of um, uh, de denotes sort of which fraction of the blood received which amount of dose. Um, and the idea was to correlate that then to lymphocyte depletion. Um, just to give you a little bit more insight into the stochastic compartmental model that, that we use for this. Um, so it's based on sort of jump probability. So, so often you would see these type of compartmental modelings um, in sort of pharma, pharma kinetic modelling, which are then based on um, ODEs, like system of ODEs. Um, however, we wanted to be, you know, to, to explicitly model um, discrete particles. So we had to convert this sort of into um, a stochastic model, basically. So, so it's it's basically a Markov chain with jumping probabilities between compartments um, that are given by the rate um, between those compartments. So the exchange rates kind of between those compartments and the time step that we are considering. Um, and obviously the probability to stay in a certain compartment is one minus uh, the sum of all those jumping probabilities. Um, and this is determined by sort of the flow between compartments. So how much, how much blood flow does the, the brain get over how much blood volume is in the brain, right? Um, and, and these quantities are known, people have studies it. Um, so there is reference values for this, uh, which we used. Um, and from this, of course, it follows sort of a mean transit time in each uh, compartment. Um, so th th there's a little bit of a problem with this, we thought at least, um, so th th this Markov process, um, 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 how, do, how would you say that, um, property, property, and that was the word I was looking for, um, sort of means that the distribution of transit times is, is exponential, right? Um, and the, and this, if you think about it, it's 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 not very um, realistic <clears throat> because it means that there's many blood particles that leave the compartment uh, quickly upon entering, and that's sort of compensated for by a long tail of particles that are actually spending uh, a very long time. Um, so so we we asked ourselves, well, can we then sort of choose this transit time distribution ourselves and and sort of do the math and sort of that and work those things out. So we opted for a viable uh, distribution of transit times. And then um, so the, the probability that the particle leaves during a given time interval is, is now based on sort of survival analysis. It was always based on survival analysis, but, um, you know, for for an exponential uh, distribution, these uh, these uh, leaving probabilities are just constant over time. Now that is not the case anymore because we have this explicit different um, uh, Bible distribution, which basically, by the way, is is an extension of um, and the exponential distribution. Uh, so a generalization. Um, so the leaving probes are now based on sort of uh, survival um, statistics, and right. So, so this has the the desired effect that you know the longer a particle stays in a given compartment, um, then for if if k is so okay. So the viable distribution depends on two parameters, right? So. The first, the, the lambda here, um, denotes sort of where where does the mean transition time 
um, where does that happen? And the K um, determines sort of the shape of this um, Bible distribution. So for different values of this kappa, it's actually a kappa, um, kappa value, uh, you, you get different properties. Um, so for example, if I pick a kappa is, is two, then we see that the, the leaving probability increases uh, the longer a particle stays in the given compartment. And that is the type of uh, behavior that we wanted to achieve. Um, obviously that the process is no longer um, Markovian anymore, right? Uh, because there, there is some notion of it's keeping track of time. How long does it stay in, in a certain compartment? Um, so that, that's about that. Um, and then the, the question sort of came up is like, well, now we can calculate the dose to, to the blood uh, very accurately, but, but how well is it really a proxy for lymphocyte dose? Because that's what we're really interested in if we're looking for sort of a mechanistic um, connection between lymphocyte dose and a depletion. So, um, and then, and then you, you dive into this rabbit hole of lymphocyte migration, um, of which the lymphocyte circulation in the blood is only a very small part, in fact. So what happens is that lymphocytes are, constant, are continuously um, searching for, for an antigens um, that might enter the body. And, and the way that it does that sort of in an efficient manner is by um, trafficking through these secondary lymphoid organs. And then these antigens get pre uh, presented there as well by um, antigen presenting cells. And then because this is much more localized than just anywhere in the system, there's a much higher chance of actually finding the antigen. Um, so there's actually quite an ingenious system of how the immune system figured this problem out. Um, but that means that that actually the, the lymphocytes that we're modeling and that we were modeling in the blood um, spend some significant amount of time in other compartments other than uh, the blood, um, namely the secondary lymphoid organs, such as the spleen and lymph nodes. Um, so it means that you know blood dose is probably not a good proxy for lymphocyte dose. So next step was to expand our um, blood flow model to to include these um, lymphoid organs and and sort of travel travel through those lymphoid organs and sort of incorporate that into a single um, dynamic system. So here, th th these are sort of um, um, cartoonesque representations of, of um, lymphocytes flow through the spleen. And here below is, is um, do you, by the way, see my mouse or am I just waving in sort of, the, uh, anyways, uh, I'm, I'm sort of waving with the mouse to, to fine, by the way, I think we're seeing it. Oh, uh, you're seeing it, okay. All right, so th this is um, in the spleen and below that it's in the lymph nodes. So, so in the spleen, um, you know, lymphocytes enter through uh, the central arterioles that are sort of dispersed in the spleen. And then they exit into the what's called the red pulp. Um, and from there, they, they either are getting picked up by open-ended arterioles, uh, venous uh, sinuses. Um, so, so it's not the in contrast to all the other organs, which are sort of closed systems between, you know, arteries and veins here, it's sort of an uh, open system where uh, blood, but also the lymphocytes um, sort of trickle down through this red pulp system and then get picked up at some point by these open-ended uh, sinuses. But then there's another route where lymphocytes actually enter the, what is called the white bulb. So there's sort of this lymphoid compartment within the spleen, um, stay there for a while. So now exit, and it's, I think, not yet completely clear how this exit takes place exactly, but somehow exit and, and rejoin sort of the, the blood circulation. Um, and then 
and in lymph nodes and also in Byers patches and, and these type of uh, organs, lymphoid organs. Um, so blood comes in also in um, via an artery and extravasates and lymphocytes extravasates through through what is called high endothelial venules um, into sort of the the tissue, uh, yeah, the, so the the lymphoid tissue of the of the lymph nodes, and then eventually drain through efferent lymphatics, um, either to the next lymph nodes or through the lymphatic duct back into again systemic blood circulation. Uh, so these are different routes that we now have to take into account um, and extend our model with. Um, but the, the these lymph nodes are actually a very complex network, right? Of of um, lymph nodes, it's, it's not just one of, or two of them. There's in a human being, there's like six hundred of them, um, sort of spread out over um, over the body and connected in in quite complicated ways. Um, and I don't think anyone sort of mapped this out quite um, quite yet. Um, because maybe this is a sort of too much of a daunting task, or maybe there was just no interest. Um, it, it's it's always weird. I find when I when I talk to sort of physicists, they 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 are like, oh yeah, obviously that should be done. It's weird that it's never been done. Um, whereas if I talk to biologists, they say, well, why would you ever care about that? It seems such random things to do. So it's I think there is this constant. And I I don't know if any of you um, sort of experienced that too, but there's this constant sort of uh, lack of understanding between modelists maybe and, and or physicists or mathematicians or whatever, and, and biologists, um, they seem to be more interested into more qualitative aspects of things rather than quantitative aspects. So, so I keep running into problems that have to do with, you know, how much Exactly, uh, you know, quantitative questions, um, which which are really hard to come by, sort of in um, in the literature. Uh, but that was just a comment uh, uh, on the side. Um, we can come back to that later if you guys want to talk about. It. Um, anyways, there's actually much more known uh, about lymphocyte trafficking in, in marine animals such as uh, mouse, mice and, and rats than in um, humans. And part of this has to do with the complexity, but also, of course, part of it has to do with sort of the experimental um, possibilities that, that, that you have in marine animals that you don't necessarily have in humans, right? So um, in marine animals, um, there's about 30 to 50 lymph nodes as compared to about 600 in, in humans. And they have well-characterized draining patterns, right? People have looked at it by just injecting uh, dye um, in, in some places and see where, it, you know, to which lymph nodes they get drained to. Um, so this has all been mapped out already in the 70s, in fact. Um, and we can convert this into a computational graph that not only tells us how things are connected in sort of the, the lymphatic um, network in, in, in the mouse, um, but also the rates, you know, how, how quickly do things flow between, um, between uh, those nodes in of the network. Um, and how do we get those rates? Well, the kinetics has, uh, have also been extensively studied in sort of the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, of the previous century. People were very interested in, in sort of these kinetics, so they would radioactively label lymphocytes um, and re inject them into, into rats, for example, but also in sheep and, and also in mice. And then just see how they distribute over different organs and and um, or even different subcompartments of organs. Um, so actually, a lot of is known about the kinetics about um, of, of lymphocyte traffic in in, in the system, but it's, it's known sort of not in. It's known in terms of data, 
let's put it that way. It's not really known in terms of simulations. Um, but so that was one of the challenges um, that, that we that we faced. Um, and another advantage is, is that much of the work that has been done on sort of um, trying to understand lymphocyte um, um, depletion after radiotherapy has been done in marine animals. So it actually makes sense to have a model for marine animals so that we can sort of not only look at experiments and then, then right? Because I often get the feeling that there's experiments being done by some group and then experiments being done by another group, but there's not really a common scaffold to put all these things together and, and get sort of a more general understanding of how things work and how thing and what the interplay between those things might be. Right. So um that brings us to you know actually uh doing the fitting and um so, so, so that we can have this flow flow model of lymphocyte migration, um, systemic migration. So it starts off with this sort of weighted directed graph, and it's weighted by by certain edges or weighted by the rates uh, that we can then convert by, to this rate matrix, um, and then can convert that again to um, sort of the migration kinetics that just you know, the, the change, I, I think we have seen this probably before, or, or maybe you have seen it somewhere else, but the change of the number of lymphocytes in some compartment is just basically the difference between the influx and the outflux. Um, right, and then why I put it like this is that it, sort of, it, it all comes from how things are connected, right? Um, so representing things as a graph is a very, very insightful way of, of then getting to the migration kinetics. Um, of course, we still have to, to fit these parameters uh, because, I mean, if they're not known. So for blood flow, they, they are typically known. Uh, for lymphocyte flow, flow uh, we uh, in through lymphatic compartments, we have to fit them. Uh, so that's being done here. Um, Right, we we have this experimental data from from these experiments of radio labeled lymphocytes, um, and this produces basically a time series of you know the, every so many minutes they sacrifice a couple of mice, um, and then they look you know how how did how, how did the lymphocyte distribute over different compartments. And we can fit our model to that to find these rate parameters, right? And if we do that, we observe that there's only 3%, right? And this comes all with a little bit of a narrow bar. So maybe maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 2%, you know, but order of 3% is in the blood at any given time. Whereas 20% is in spleen and 70% is in mm -hmm. lymph nodes. Um, so that sort of already hints to the fact that maybe the blood is actually not so important when we look at um, lymphocyte depletion um, following radiation, because you would assume that if this process keeps on going, even after radiation, that you know this, e even though you cause a drop in lymphocytes in the blood, this will be quickly restored by replenishment from other compartments. Um, yeah, and this is just sort of practically then how how do we calculate those two lymphocytes, right? Because we, now we have this system of ODEs, um, but as I showed before in, in sort of the blood flow model, we wanted to, in order for having particles to pick up those, you know, uh, in a sort of stochastic manner, we want to convert this into a stochastic walk through the compartments um, so that we can track individual uh, lymphocytes. Um, and we combine this with um, so marine phantoms of um, so mesh phantoms of of um, the mouse and and rats. We have different mesh phantoms for that, so that we can. Of course, our dose distribution is in three D, right? So if we want to assign those to lymphocytes, we have to know where in sort of three D space they are, um, and we use these um, marine mesh phantoms in order to sort of go from this 
zero D, if you will, sort of this comportamental model through sort of a three D um, uh, model of sort of where we can track the trajectories of each uh, set. And this is then just um, some uh, results that, that it gives you. For example, here I simulate um, spleen splenic irradiation. Uh, so the spleen is, as 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 we have discussed, sort of this important uh, lymphatic organ that has a lot of lymphocytes um, sort of stored or sort of temporarily stored at least. Um, and for photons, you see that. Uh, just due to the uh, physics of, of photon beams, uh, they basically penetrate um, throughout the, the 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 mouse if if you irradiate them with photons. Whereas in protons, you get this very nice early stopping um, of of the beams, um, and this results in. Um, well, no. All right. Oh, five minutes warning. All right. I don't know how much, how long that was ago because I, I just checked the chat. Uh, well, anyways, um, so so you get more, uh, more radiation with photons, uh, basically, and this especially in in sort of the lymphatic compartments. Um, these are just a couple of examples. So you have the same thing for for brain irradiation. And if you convert that into survival, you, you observe the protons as a much better sort of survival, predicted survival because of this uh, sparing of lymphoid organs that takes place. You also observe that the blood contribution is actually very negligible compared to sort of the contribution of lymphoid organs. Um, and this is just sort of the genetics of, you know, uh, irradiation takes place you might deplete a bunch of things in, in different sort of um, organs in the blood in, in uh, a lymphatic part of organs um, in, in lymph nodes or pyre patches, but then it also sort of reestablishes a new equilibrium through this sort of systemic um, circulation process. Um, and we can sort of uh, redo a couple of these experiments. Um, I, I have no idea how much time I have, so I'm going to go quickly here. Um, and we did that and, and sort of were able to uh, reproduce the trends um, that we have, that were observed in those um, experiments. So that brings me to the conclusion. Um, so we build a model for uh, in silico replications of preclinical studies on lymphopenia. Um, it suggests that uh, radiation induced lymphopenia is caused by irradiation of secondary lymphoid organs rather than the blood. And therefore, the sparing of lymph nodes might uh, help to mitigate lymphopenia. Um, just a couple of discussion points um, for you to think about and for me to think about. And then um, I'll end over uh, the, the talking to someone else. Yeah, down here. Thank you.